I'm Paul Rogge, and in full disclosure, I'm an Army colonel, but I also have another life. I'm a, a reserve officer, so I have a civilian career working in the Department of Energy realm. So I'm an old engineering manager, worked in the nuclear business for a number of years. Um, I actually didn't understand the uh, presentation before last because I studied plasma physics, and that wasn't about plasma physics. One of the things that has bothered me for a long time, uh, watching... Uh, and sometimes participating in the military operations that we have is that it seemed to me that we're not really filling out our energy portfolio uh, to meet all of our military needs. And in particular, here we have this capability of nuclear energy that has high energy densities, a low logistics requirement, uh, some real characteristics uh, that might be useful for military operations, and yet we're not really looking at that. It's not really part of the portfolio. We're behind the curve in bringing that into the portfolio so that we have a better uh, energy uh, capability for the force, or we need to understand that for some reason it's not suitable, in which case we're behind the curve working on the alternative. So either way, we need to figure out whether nuclear fits into the portfolio or not, and then get working on either the nuclear or the plan B, whatever that is. With that in mind, um, I've uh, come on to active duty and been working on uh, requirements for operational energy. So my job working down at Fort Monroe is to develop the Army's requirements for the force in the field, but also for other parts of military operations. We think about soldiers uh, carrying heavy backpacks walking around Afghanistan. We see pictures of convoys being blown up, um, but there are other uh, aspects to operations. We have worldwide uh, information networks, we have space assets providing uh, communications and information. Um, we have people telecommuting, sort of. There's people sitting in Creech Air Force Base, Nevada, flying UAVs over in Afghanistan. So military operations actually are not as uh, sort of discreet as we might think. They're, they're pretty pervasive. So that's what my job is, is to really understand what are the requirements um, for operational energy because nobody seemed to have really uh, defined that. And it's really tough as an engineer to design the solution. A lot of us sit here and have great solutions, but the problem is we don't really know how to tell whether they fit in or not. So that's what my job is. And what I'd like to talk about is uh, uh, what are the requirements, how, how might nuclear energy fit into those, um, and what sorts of things should we consider um, in that respect. When we're trying to establish military requirements, we look at what we're doing today. So we look at the current conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, and you've seen the pictures. You've, you have a really different picture from what we used to think about in the military. Um, we spent many years you know, going through world wars. Then in the Cold War, we imagined a similar kind of a conflict with huge formations out on the battlefield moving around, highly mobile, um, highly massed. This is all in a world where you know, oil is plentiful. The U.S. had lots of oil, or you can go any place in the world and buy oil. And so uh, it seemed like a really good plan just to run off of uh, petroleum fuels and we would have a military that's based on that. And the ships can run bunker or whatever, the tanks can run diesel fuel. And, and that seemed to work really well, especially when it was all theoretical because we weren't really at war, we just were imagining it. So now we're actually at war and we're fighting in some pretty remote places and we don't have these mass formations. We don't have closed lines of communication where you know we, we secure the supply line. And now um, petroleum fuels are becoming a little bit problematic. A uh, basic premise that we've had for decades that petroleum is the, the simple, cheap, available way to go is coming into question. So we need to be um, really rethinking that. Well, not only is that uh, presumption for the military force in the battlefield something that we need to rethink, but back home, those operations that I mentioned uh, with the networks and the space assets and the UAV pilots, um, all of those could be vulnerable to some kind of a uh, disruption. People are starting to realize that the national power grid could be vulnerable to either a kinetic attack or cyber attack. Somebody takes out a big transformer or a control system and pretty soon the whole East Coast is dark. We also have this concern about how do we assure that we have the energy needed uh, back home. When people talk about this, uh, there, are, there is a lot of discussion about the idea that military bases need to be able to island themselves. And so you can 
open all the switches and the base keeps the lights on and the whole community is dark around them. And uh, one thing that I like to maybe encourage is thinking more in terms of resilient communities. So people who are in the emergency planning business don't think of bases anymore as being separate from the community. You have uh, agreements on law enforcement, fire protection, emergency services, hospitals, all those sorts of things. The workers who keep the bases going live in the community. When you think about this uh, resilient energy, even if you think about maybe losing the larger grid, I just encourage not thinking about the base as an island, but as the community as something that can be resilient and can maintain critical functions. And so you don't have people sitting on the base playing with their Wii or their Xbox while the people off base are, are losing power to their uh, life support. You, you have some kind of a give and take there. And then there's a kind of an in-between case. There are remote sites or sites that have critical functions that use a lot of energy, and those kinds of cases might be a good application for something like, say, nuclear energy, where you've got a lot of energy available, you don't have the logistics requirements, and so it's another one of those sort of use cases we might want to be thinking about. So besides the nature of the threat sort of changing, we have the nature of the, the resource shifting. It used to be we could count on getting oil from West Texas and Alaska and uh, American resources. But if you look at the map in the upper right, that is intended to reflect known reserves. So the big countries have a lot of oil. Small countries have uh, a little bit of oil. So U.S. is not really big on there anymore. If you remember the color codes that you just saw, the countries that are sort of a cooler color like blue, they don't use so much uh, energy and the countries that are sort of the warmer colors like the U.S. use more energy. So there's an imbalance there. We use a lot, but we don't have a lot. That could be a little bit of a, an issue because uh, energy seems to correlate with influence. And so people who have energy, which used to be the U.S., we had a lot of influence. Now there are others who have a lot of energy and they seem to be gaining influence in the world. So the real question is, whether the U.S. is missing a strategic national security opportunity by failing to aggressively pursue advanced reactors. Uh, if you look at the ground forces today, we seem to be using a lot of energy, uh, and people wonder, you know, whether we could cut that down. Well, the energy is used for good purposes. So the reason that we can fight in the night and basically take out enemies without losing uh, our own soldiers is because we have energy-powered capabilities. We have sensors. We're getting into directed energy systems. We've got uh, transportation, airborne vehicles, all sorts of things that give us the advantage, and they're all based on energy. So we don't really see that going away. In fact, on top of that, we're finding that it's really important if we're going to sustain a force to, to really sustain the people. So it's one thing to go into an area, you know, like the Operation Panama. We went for a day or two. People execute the operation. They leave. They didn't have to take a shower. They didn't really have to have a place to, to rest up. Um, but in the kinds of operations that we do today, you actually need to be able to sustain people. And so now they need to be able to have uh, water to drink and, and even take a bath and get a good night's sleep because they've got to continue to operate for long periods of time. We're not going to see the need for energy really go away. We're going to actually see an increased need for sustained energy out in operational areas. That raises uh, a problem because, as I described before, you don't have these mass formations, closed lines of communication anymore. Now you have a smaller group of people deployed somewhere in a more remote location. So Afghanistan, for example, is a, is a pretty tough place because uh, you don't have the power grids, you don't have distribution systems for petroleum fuels uh, to sustain our kind of forces. And so you have to bring all that stuff with you. And by the way, it's a big country. And so we have forces scattered in hundreds of patrol bases and forward operating bases across the country. So this logistics of energy becomes really difficult. The pie chart uh, is intended to illustrate you know, how much logistics play into, how much um, liquids play into fuel. So the water is like half of the, the pie. Blue section there is another 30 to 40 percent of the logistics chain. So the way that we're sustaining the force is we're trucking liquids over the ground, and then we're also carrying some other stuff. If we didn't have to carry all that liquid, that 80% of the supply chain, we might be able to find another way. Maybe we could fly supplies in, maybe we could have uh, enough stocks for a longer period of time, 
So we could look at different ways to conduct the operations, but we're kind of stuck today with this logistics tale of uh, water and liquid fuels. So what would be some alternatives to approach this? Um, people are working on alternative energy sources. We're putting solar panels out into the field. There have been proposals that you could use biomass, maybe take poppy seeds and crush them to make oil and burn it in the generators or, or the vehicles. Probably useful ideas. A lot, most of the technologies have a place. They work well in the right situation. Uh, and in fact, what we're you know, questioning today is, is there a niche that nuclear needs to fill? So looking at the, the, the big energy needs of a force, let's say you have 20,000 soldiers and contractors out in the field, you need 50 megawatts of power. Well, that's a lot of fuel. Um, over the course of a year, maybe 30 million gallons of fuel that you have to haul from Kyrgyzstan through Pakistan from some other place uh, because you don't refine it in Afghanistan. And even if you did, the refinery would be on the other side of the country. So one way is to deliver the fuel another and the water because water either has to be delivered or you need energy to produce it. Um, another alternative would be solar power. Or why not? put solar collectors out there. Well, that could be suitable in some cases, depending on the weather, depending on sort of the load profile. If, if you need energy during the day and not at night, uh, you could put out about 100 acres of solar panels and that would give you enough power for this base. In some places that might uh, be a good answer, but on some other places, especially if you have a threat out there, that might not work too well because you have to secure the whole perimeter. And so now all your soldiers spend their time patrolling the 100 acre solar uh, farm. So again, not every solution fits uh, every case. Biomass, if you hire local farmers to grow switchgrass, you only need about 35 tons an hour uh, of switchgrass to produce the 50 megawatts of uh, energy. You know, that, that may or may not fit, but certainly there are uh, large groups of forces over in Afghanistan where you don't really have that kind of um, agricultural production. So. Um, it, it doesn't always work. So another option is a nuclear reactor. It's a depiction of a, a nuclear reactor that's about man size. So presumably you could make a 50 megawatt reactor and the fuel you know, isn't very big at all. It's the other, it's the vessel and the controls and the coolant and all that. So that's on the scale of a man and then uh, that is dwarfed by the scale of the fuel that we're having to deliver, which is of course much smaller than the pile of switchgrass that you had to uh, gasify. What if you could take this nuclear power over into the field and somehow use that way? You can't put nuclear reactors on tanks yet because of a number of reasons, including people worrying about, you know, if somebody captures a tank, now they've got a reactor. Really, in order to do that, you have to come up with some kind of a systems approach. And we've talked a little bit down at Fort Monroe, and, and you may read it occasionally in a story, about something called an adaptive brigade. And the idea behind the adaptive brigade is that this force could go anywhere, basically, and, and provide its own energy and water and not really have to be resupplied for, say, a month at a time. A nuclear reactor would be a piece of such a concept. That's the only way we know right now that you could provide that kind of energy. But then there are other um, aspects of that. You have to figure out, you know, how do I run vehicles? Um, do I have plug-in hybrids? Do I have to produce sin fuel? How am I going to produce water? Does that depend on the geography? So it's really a big, it's more of a systems engineering and a coordination of technologies exercise than it is, can I build a, a little nuclear reactor? On the other hand, from a non-technical standpoint, being able to take a nuclear reactor wherever I want to is a big question. It's just not so much a technical question. What we're trying to focus on, though, is the operational use case. And this seems like one case where it would make sense consistent with our doctrine and our expectations of the future where a nuclear uh, power source might make some sense. So is it realistic to think we could do that? Well, uh, we built nuclear reactors many decades ago, and so if all those people haven't died off or didn't forget to write down the formulas, we probably could go back and build small nuclear reactors again. Uh, and we build a variety of them. We build a small, that's a picture of ML1, that was transported in a I forget, a C1 something, it wasn't a 130, out to Idaho, and they drove around the desert, put the thing on a low bed trailer, set it up and operated it, produced energy. We, we went all the way from that kind of a scale 
to a floating 10 megawatt barge, the Sturgis, which is currently parked uh, right offshore from my office. Fort Greeley, Fort uh, Belvoir had stationary reactors. Sundance, Wyoming, I've actually driven past Sundance. I never saw the reactor up on the hill, but I have pictures of it. So we, we tried all kinds of things, and so surely it can be done from a technical standpoint. From an operational standpoint, the Navy's demonstrated with as many reactors as we have in the civilian world, safe operation, reliable power, uh, and so the Navy certainly knows how to do this. They certainly have demonstrated that there's value. Think about the security posture that the U.S. would have if we didn't have this nuclear capability compared to what we have today with the Navy patrolling. Uh, you know, submarines can stand or water and, and go under the polar ice cap. Uh, a ship could be on, on cruise for a year at a time if they want. Those kinds of capabilities you just don't really accomplish without that capability of nuclear power. So what about the concern that, you know, if we get into nuclear energy, then that's really going to create safety problems, proliferation issues uh, out in the world. We're going to make a worse world because now there's nukes floating all over the place. Uh, nuclear power right now produces about 14% of the world's electrical power. It's about 20% in the U.S. You can bet that 20% isn't, doesn't represent the 14%. There's a lot of other places that have nuclear power. France, about 76%, Lithuania, 72%, Slovakia, 56%. If we don't get into or, or revive our nuclear capability, um, are those people going to now stop producing nuclear energy, stop producing fuel or designing reactors? Uh, new construction starts in China, Russia, Korea are the largest numbers. The uh, UAE has a, what, a $40 billion deal. They're going to build nuclear reactors to power uh, the Emirates, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, on the Persian Gulf, because they don't want to burn their oil, right? Their oil is their future. That's the resource that's providing money for a sustainable future of some sort, and they're trying to figure out what that is. But certainly burning that oil is not the answer to their future. Uh, they went out with a large global competition to see who would be the best source for nuclear power to take UAE into the future. And they looked around and they ended up hiring the Koreans. So what does that tell you about um, the influence of and the outcome of the U.S. not pursuing the nuclear energy? Are there uh, technologies available out there? Well, this is just a sort of a short list of some of the um, reactors that are fairly well-developed concepts and or are actually being uh, offered by vendors. If we want to do something say for the military, we certainly have a long list to pick from. Uh, what kind of a reactor would we be talking about? Well, category of reactors called small reactors, 300 megawatts or less. If you're going to provide power for a military base, you might be talking that <coughs> scale, but deployable reactor that you cart around the countryside, then I think we're talking maybe, you know, on the order of 10 megawatts. So pretty small reactor. Well, what about small reactors? We haven't been building small reactors. Why not? Well, if you build a reactor in the domestic market today, you know, there are a lot of fixed costs. You got a security force, you got the licensing cost. Uh, there are these economies of scale that we presume if you build a big reactor and you produce a lot of power, then that 40 man security force and the large evacuation zone that you had to maintain gets distributed over a lot of kilowatt hours that you're selling. If you build a small reactor, that's a lot of guards per kilowatt hour. Well, in a, in a military situation especially, we might be able to realize some of the benefits that people have attributed to small reactors. Maybe you don't need as much of a security force because maybe it's not as attractive a target for the bad guys. Maybe you don't need as big an evacuation zone because the source term is much smaller. So all of these hypothetical benefits of a small reactor, um, a more efficient production if you can fabricate it in the shop and uh, bring the modules together on site uh, and have a modular construction process, those kinds of things we could demonstrate if we were to build something for a military application because in a deployed case at least you may not have those same sort of domestic constraints on planning zones and, and the other things that drive the fixed uh, costs. What has prevented uh, the small reactors from uh, being deployed domestically? Well there's certainly a lot of designs out there so everybody uh, is pushing a different design. Um, arguably um, nobody's really made the, the business case that helps you pick the design, but most of all, um, 
you know, we really are set up to build the, the large plants. So if you go to NRC uh, to get a license, they have the review guides. They're all based upon the last plant that we built. And so now if you want to build a different plant, then that's a little bit of a, a, little bit of a challenge because you got to come up with new review guides. And so they've basically told people that have innovative reactors that you're going to be at the end of the line. There are some barriers to uh, innovative reactor development, I think, on the civilian side uh, that potentially could be overcome if we uh, chose to pursue nuclear power for a military application. What would be uh, some motivators for the military to pursue something like this? Well, there's the defense benefits. If we have assured power for the forces in the field, reduced logistics requirements, more reliable energy or more available energy for some kind of domestic application, uh, clearly that has a, a benefit in terms of national defense. Uh, for the larger economy, uh, this could represent a clean energy source that if the military were to pursue it and to foster some designs and some in industrial capability, then uh, perhaps that would make it easier to implement uh, out in the civilian economy. And so the economy might grow. It might be a, a sector of clean energy that could advance uh, domestically. Non-proliferation, contrary to sort of popular opinion, um, I think one could argue that with the U.S. participating in the market and establishing what the standards and requirements are, we could move back toward the position that we had years ago where the U.S. was the gold standard. And NRC was the entity that everybody looked to for the right answer on, on regulation, safety review, those kinds of things. The design standards were U.S. Uh, we, you know, we didn't build Chernobyl. Um, and so when we're participating, then we have more chance to influence the way things are built. If we uh, establish the, the standard designs, or at least we establish the design standards, then we have a greater chance to influence what's being built in Slovakia or Korea or UAE or other countries. Bottom line, global demand uh, for energy is growing. Petroleum is going to be problematic. DOE really needs to think about in those domestic cases, what do we really need in terms of continued operations? Do we need to invest in something that, that improves our capability to continue uh, operating when the grid goes down? Uh, big question whether nuclear would be uh, appropriate for these different cases, the deployed, the remote sites, or the domestic installations. We need to do some analysis and understand, you know, do the pros and cons outweigh each other. In any case, uh, nuclear energy isn't going to stop because the U.S. doesn't pursue it. So we can either be on the wagon or we can buy foreign reactors in the future. So uh, that's basically what I've uh, concluded so far, and I'm, uh, I think we can take some questions when we want. Is there a military or strategic, specifically Army, uh, requirements for either disaster relief or when you're in a host country providing services, being free electricity to the local community, and is that as important as its own needs, uh, uh, you know, is that taken into consideration? The requirement for military to have uh, power uh, is, is a little bit complex because you have the sustainment of the forces, that's a requirement, and, and certainly we fill that with generators and we provide fuel to them. Uh, so the requirement is being met today. Um, we have requirements in some cases to uh, provide um, basically stability operations, we call it. We provide humanitarian assistance or security assistance or help uh, economies and societies to become more stable by through economic uh, growth and so in those cases we go out and we uh, help people and, and in Afghanistan for example we put in clean water systems and solar systems and we've taught people to build windmills so those those energy needs are all um, valid military requirements and so really the the question about nuclear is does that fit in as a better answer uh, to meet some of those needs when you look at the the fruit salad of requirements for, sec for security, logistics, uh, manpower, uh, economic considerations, where does it fit in? Um, are you looking at just for the Army or are you also looking for all of DOD, in particular the Navy and powering ships? The Navy powering ships is a pretty well established entity and I don't think anybody really needs to delve into that too much because they know 
they're very smart. They know the answer. Outside the Navy, um, I've in in my regular job, I'm looking at Army operational energy requirements. I, I work a lot with the Marines, so really ground forces um, requirements are what I'm focusing on. In the nuclear context, there is some exchange between the departments talking about whether nuclear kind of in general would be feasible. And in fact, uh, there's a study that Congress directed to be conducted uh, on the feasibility of nuclear power for this domestic case for, for secure energy for military bases. And so uh, the services work together. Uh, we collaborated and that study I think is going to be delivered to Congress fairly soon. So, so we're looking across the, the forces, but for the, for the deployed application, I'm looking at ground forces. You told us uh, two years ago that basically nuclear might be a good choice for ground forces, and I'm sort of hearing the same thing. Uh, could you give us the feeling for what, what has changed in the last two years, and what is your estimate about where actually something might happen? Yeah, so a couple of things have changed, uh, and it's been dynamic. Uh, since that time, uh, public opinion really uh, swayed over toward pro-nuclear, and the president came out and announced that nuclear, that was what, last January? Not this January, but last. Um, that nuclear should be part of our clean energy portfolio. Dr. Chu came out, Secretary of Energy, said we need to pursue nuclear. Uh, then March 11th, uh, there was an event over in uh, Japan, and I think the reactors survived the earthquake, but they weren't ready for the flooding of the tsunami. And so that really set people back. So uh, in general, certainly there's been a a major movement uh, and an important one in the in the political circles because the mm -hmm. national policy really is is the driver I think you know is the country going to pursue this or not uh, in Germany not you know in the US it, it kind of remains to be seen just recently uh, the, the Fukushima events I think have sort of disrupted the the, the momentum and I don't know how that's going to fall out Nuclear power seems like just another one of those complicated technical issues that you have to explain to general officers. And, and, and I, I watched one General Vane one day sort of having issues with understanding where energy came from in a hybrid drive vehicle. Do you have any suggestions or techniques or lessons learned from communicating these sorts of issues to three stars? Because they don't get it, things don't happen. And I sort of you were exactly in that spot, so I was sort of wondering what you could share. I think we have that issue whether it's nuclear or otherwise. Uh, you mentioned, you know, Jerome Vane trying to get his arms around what, is, what does hybrid vehicle mean, and I would say that it isn't, you know, the, the base technology. I mean, he understands electric motors, he understands uh, liquid fuel in, internal combustion engines. Um, the real harder question is how does that play out operationally, and, and that's my daily business, trying to translate the, the operational concepts into the hardware software solutions uh, and there are a lot of people involved in that. So I work with the people who do soldier technologies and maneuver, pe people who do base camp things who are not generally engineers to help them sort of picture how does, how does the hardware software piece fit into the operational piece and, and that's exactly what we're working on now capture that better in documents. I have an operational energy um, strategy, actually, in case you're interested, on the web. I think it's on the ARCIC website, arcic.army.mil, and there's video and, and some other resources that sort of hopefully start the thought process so that people understand this energy and technology thing and how it relates to the guys on the ground doing what they do. In terms of the flexibility to operate in environments, and I would assume that you would you would need some on-site procurement of, of materials and fuels of which you would to do so successfully to have a freedom of uh, resource input you would need a high temperature heat source to get the chemistry to work is that high temp requirement for a high temperature heat source a, a, a official requirement or is that or is that still being debated about whether we can go to lower temperatures say in, in, in hundreds of degrees C or are we talking or do you have an operational requirement to go up to about thousands of degrees C? So our operational requirements are defined in terms of capabilities. So there'll be things like the ability to, for this unit to move so fast, so far, in, in such a period of time, to be resupplied by air, um, to sustain 72 hours uh, dismounted operations, 
and you might break that down a little bit more and talk about how much the soldier has to carry or that sort of thing. The, those operational requirements are not particularly defined in terms of um, you know, how many kilowatt hours or how many degrees something needs to be. Um, that starts to get into engineering requirements, which depend on the system. So uh, we don't have a system that has, for example, a nuclear reactor in it, so uh, there's no engineering requirement because we haven't defined that kind of a system. We're not doing synthetic fuels uh, in the field, so there's not a sort of a plug-in engineering requirement for that. So we don't really have those kinds of engineering requirements that would drive like this heat source. So the bigger question is, are you going to produce, say, sin fuels um, out in the tactical world? You know, do you want to have the manpower out there, the footprint, the uh, potential target, other considerations uh, weighing off against the benefit of not having to haul the fuel from, you know, Kyrgyzstan, which may close the base and not allow, allow us to fly from there. So, so we don't have a, a specific requirement like that. Most of your fuel requirements are for vehicles, um, particularly aircraft where I don't see any uh, substitute for petroleum-based uh, fuels, at least in the near future. But uh, also, wouldn't a nuclear reactor, a portable one, be very vulnerable to be uh, destroyed by enemy uh, fire? I mean, uh, particularly a sophisticated enemy, uh, which had cruise missiles or uh, some other uh, technology that could zero in on the reactor. Uh, wouldn't a reactor be vulnerable to some kind of an attack? Um, whether it would be more vulnerable than another kind of generator, I'm not really sure kind of depends on how you harden it, how you protect it. Um, I would uh, suggest, because it, it's kind of a common thought, um, you know, we've, we have a lot of sensitive things that we take out in the field. We have highly classified information. We used to carry around nuclear weapons. Even the armor in an Abrams tank, by the way, is classified. So we don't leave, a tank gets destroyed, we don't leave it sitting there because uh, we don't want somebody to open it up and exploit the design of the armor. So there are a lot of things out there in the field that we protect. In the case of the reactor, um, I'm not sure that a, a reactor by nature would be any more vulnerable than a diesel generator or some other, you know, piece of equipment. Um, if somebody would be more likely to target it, good question. You know, it's a it's probably analysis that ought to be done. Who would license the deployable reactor? And is there a security problem if we design this thing and then? It becomes commercialized and other people could build it. The question about licensing is not entirely clear. The uh, Atomic Energy Act has maybe created some options. Uh, so DOE, DOD have some authorities to um, oversee a nuclear reactor if it's not for uh, civilian power use. So uh, it's possible that especially a prototype might be um, overseen by DOE if they were willing. Um, the military might have authority, but you know, if we're not doing it, then uh, right now there's not a lot of infrastructure within, say, the Army or Air Force anyway, to oversee a reactor. NRC would have a problem because now you're talking about something that's going to operate outside the U.S. So their whole process, based on siting and and you know their review process, doesn't work. Uh, so that's a big question. Um, that's one of the things that would have to be worked out. As far as the security, the design, um, we, uh, a lot of us rule out the idea, for example, of co-opting a nuclear reactor design from a, a naval propulsion system for this ground-based system because we think about what if somebody captures it, what if they get a hold of the material. Um, surely there are some small reactor designs that are more benign and you're not worried about somebody getting the design. It, it would be perfectly fine. And I just throw out the, the idea that what if we had a reactor that was so safe and simple and economical that uh, you could take it out on the battlefield and use it and then when you leave, maybe you leave it for the host nation and they run it. Of course, they'll need U.S. fabricated parts and fuel and that sort of thing, but so there would be maybe expanding U.S. markets even. But uh, if you think in terms of you know keeping it safe and keeping it simple, I think that's the way to go anyway. So the security issue I think you can deal with the licensing is a big question. What would you say to a three-star now about uh, Lifter? Uh, what I tell the generals is that there are a lot of um, uh, technologies out there, and, and there are several different reactor types and 
different characteristics. Uh, so that suggests to me that when we figure out what we really need, we can probably find something that will fit that. But the, the generals are concerned today with, you know, the questions that are not so technically related. There are things like, uh, would we carry a nuclear reactor into another country if we're there under hostile conditions or they're under, you know, host nation invitation? Um, would we take it in a hostile zone where it might get hit by fire? Would we live with a nuclear fuel cycle and all the infrastructure and training and stuff that comes with it. So all of those things really don't even depend on what kind of reactor type. So it's it's kind of premature, I think, for three stars to worry about which reactor. The question is, do we want a reactor? I realize, sir, that you have delivered this presentation before the DOD people and DOE in the past. Is your work enhanced by operational difficulties like when the 200 tankers were trapped on the Pakistani side of the border and they started blowing up these tankers. I mean, does that become a kind of an obvious thing to people who are planning operations <laughs> that there is a, um, a tremendous vulnerability in the uh, pipeline of trying to get tanker trucks to the front lines and to deliver uh, fuel? And I guess part B of this is that, you know, we've been asked about uh, contemplating a Sputnik moment. And I know that Secretary Chu and the President of the United States have talked about this, and we have the People's Republic of China who have announced that they are going to build a uh, thorium uh, small modular reactor uh, based on the liquid salts. Uh, do, do these things enhance your work? Because you obviously are the expert in this field. Tankers blowing up don't enhance anybody's work. But uh, uh, to your point, you know, is, is the awareness uh, helpful? Is, does that help people to understand the situation? Sure. Um, it, the, the more people recognize, the guys over in the field already know how hard it is to deliver all the logistics. Been there, done that. For the broader um, community to be aware and to really have a better sense of the cost benefits, um, I think it, it probably does help. And, and the Sputnik moment thing actually is uh, sort of emergent. It's not still well known yet. It's not widely known. Um, but it might be pretty soon. Well, thank you very much, Colonel. I think we're going to have to watch it. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it.